if a woman has 37 husbands and they all die? Well, we'll get to that story in Mark 12. All right, so remember, Mark has 16 chapters. We are on 12, so we are getting towards the very end. We are in the last third of Mark. So he begins in speaking in parables. Now, we don't see a lot of parables inside of Mark. We do see some and one new one, but he talks in parables just like he does in all the other books. Talks about the man who plants a vineyard and produces a wine press. And, you know, this is a big, costly endeavor and has tenants. But essentially, the tenants go and they kill his son. This is highlighted of people being given the great land of Israel and building this entire wonderful thing built for them. And they go and just treat it shamefully and kill his son. This is what's happening right now. This is a message. And Jesus says, the stone that the builders rejected becomes the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. The cornerstone is everything. It is what the entire building is based on and saying, you threw out you builders, the best stone, which is Jesus. And it's going to turn out to be the corner of everything. That's what he's going to talk about now. So they got sick of him, the structure, the temple structure, and they just decided we're going to arrest him. But they were afraid and afraid of the people. And they kind of got the idea. These parables are against them. So they went away, I'm sure, plotting. He quoted parts of Psalm 118. That said about the stone and the cornerstone, but afterwards it's a very famous Bible passage in the minds of many people, both Christian and Jewish alike. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's interesting that some of the commentaries we're talking about, because it talked about all the things that the temple structure, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were doing to the people, namely taking away their land rights over tax issues, letting the Romans do things to the common people while protecting their own skins. Jesus didn't talk to them about anything like that. He didn't complain about all those things. Instead, what he talks about is the people, that they were exploiting the poor. His parables of fruit and now talking about this is about the bottom-up world that Jesus cares about. He condemns the middleman, the, the tenants in his parable, not the workers on the farm and not the wine owner, which would be God. Instead, he's saying, you're not helping the people in between. And a lot of the commentaries talked about Isaiah 5-7 that says it gave a clear sorting out of the vineyard topic. Mark doesn't do that. He ends this entire psalm with a question mark. What are we talking about? What are we shedding on light? And what are we referencing in these Psalms? One of the interesting things that I read when I was reading about Mark is that he loves irony. (laughs) I didn't know that. How ironic. And he loves leaving with question marks. He wants people to think about what is being said. So he's not trying like Matthew was, was to saying, this is a prophecy and this is how it's fulfilled. Instead, he's saying, hmm, look at that. Really interesting. Jesus is bringing down the law. Then the next part comes in is that some of the Pharisees and the Herodians, those are going to be the Sadducees and the temple structure, try to trap him. See, so we're having intrigue now. And it says, teacher, we know that you are true and you don't care about anyone's opinion. Can you just hear that being said sarcastically? All right. I didn't. For you're not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? He knew what they were up to. They're sitting there like being kind and saying, oh, we know you're true and you don't care about appearances. Have you ever looked in a mirror, Jesus? I mean, they're not saying anything other than to make it seem like they were appreciating Jesus. And of course, he knew they were hypocrites. So then he says, why do you put me to the test? You know, why are you testing me? Jesus, in every case, has accepted honest questions. Think about the Phoenician woman talking about the table scraps for the pet dog. He doesn't mind questions. He will answer honest questions. These are not honest questions. So this is where he says, bring me a coin, a denarius, a day's wage, and whose picture on it? 
That's going to be Tiberius Caesar. And he says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God. Render means to return. Like if I borrowed a library book and I brought it back, I would be rendering the library book back to the library. So he said, like, this is his. You deal with him. And the funny thing is people were very poor. The taxes were very high. And it was paid to the emperor's treasury in Rome. So the money wasn't even staying there, although the Romans did do some of the things they do when they're in places. And most people hated it. The Essenes and the Zealots, they wouldn't pay it. That's why they went out into the countryside, because they were avoiding the whole thing. So one of the commentaries said that there was a ground tax, which was 10% of grain, 20% of wine and fruit. Then the second was an income tax, which was 1% of a man's income. Then there was a third tax, which was a poll tax paid for all men ages 12 to 65 and women from 14 to 65. And that was one denarius, which was a day's wage for any typical laborer. And so the question is, as he said, should we pay it? And of course, this is a trap because if he said no, this would be good enough reason right there to haul him in front of Pilate and saying, this guy's saying avoid taxes. And if he said yes, well, then the people are going to hate him because they hate taxes. So just a trap to try to get him into trouble. And yet again, Jesus saw through it and he knew that this was a trap. Look, recognize Caesar. When you're here and you're under Caesar's control and you're using Caesar's coin, you're obliged to pay for the taxes that he calls for because it's his kingdom. My kingdom, I'm sure he's saying, is someplace else. Again, the Romans are going to appreciate a man who answers his own questions. Then the Sadducees come to me, and this is kind of the funnier one, because first of all, remember, the Sadducees only believe in the Torah, the first five books of scripture, which means none of the prophets, which also means not resurrection or any of the things that were said. They just are all the rules all the time. And he said, well, if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife, but no children, so there's no one now to take over the property of that man. The brother should take his brother's widow and have children with her. But let's say that there were seven brothers who took a wife and when he died, left no, you know, and so the whole thing is ridiculous. So one died and then the next one died and then the next one died. And so now this woman has seven husbands in heaven. Like I said, this whole story is ridiculous. They don't even believe in heaven. So this is just a question to be jerks about it. So then Jesus said, and I thought this was funny. I don't know. This cracked me up. Is this not the reason you're wrong? You know neither scripture nor the power of God. And he says that when we're raised from the dead, we're not going to be married or given in marriage. We're going to be like the angels. As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses and how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is something you say when you're Jewish all the time. He's not the God of dead people. He's the God of living people. We heard this in Matthew, too, where he was saying that the tax collectors were all going to be having lunch with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If what you think of the scripture and not having any mention in the books of Moses, the first five books, you don't even know what they say because it does talk about resurrection. Are you saying that God is talking about a bunch of caskets that he's in charge of? And so he points out how wrong they are, even though they believe in what they say they believe. And we see that, right? We see people who say, well, I study the scripture all the time and the scripture doesn't say a word about X, Y, and Z, right? And you're like, have you? Have you read the scriptures? Because I'm pretty sure it does. You know, people will make the scripture say whatever you want them to say. And that's why it's imperative we read it. I think we go over it slowly enough so we can understand it. So when people come to us with these kinds of things, we know better because we read it in scripture. We read the words that are said. So I think that that is just a a lesson to us to not just listen to whatever someone says. We are challenged all the time about our beliefs in God, about our beliefs in Jesus, if we're Christians. If you're not a Christian, you know, please talk to someone about some of the questions you have. Because half the time you're told something and it turns out not to be true. What I was told from my father is that the New Testament was just a propaganda piece for a bunch of apostles to make themselves look good. I never read the scriptures. I don't know that he read the scriptures. But clearly, the New Testament is not any of that. But I just took him at his word. 
you have to be careful about what people tell you. And if these people have been going on for however long saying, oh, we're the true Jewish people because we believe in the law of Moses. And it doesn't say a word about resurrection. It's not true. It does. So by Jesus telling them this you know, question, and again, getting out of their trap, it shows to everybody, he knows more about this. The Romans, who would have known nothing about this, would have been impressed because he called them out on something they pretended to know that they didn't really know. So then another one of the scribes, those are the educated people, the people study the scripture all the time, says, hey, which commandment is the most important? And Jesus answered him. And here's the funny thing is, he gave an honest answer, a real answer to this. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is a very common prayer in Judaism. It is the prayer you say all the time. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Chad. I can't think of a prayer that in Jewish times, I said more than that. And it says that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind with all your strength. Number one, we're going to love God and we're going to love our neighbors as ourselves. There is no other commandment greater than these. And I think that if you take the Ten Commandments and all the things that God asks us to do, they are summarized in those two directions. Love God and love people. That's the two most important thing. And if you do those things, you will be doing all the commandments because they're at the heart of every commandment. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have said that he is one and there's no one besides him and to love him with all your heart and understanding. He agrees with Jesus on all of that. And Jesus said something really interesting then. You are not far from the kingdom of God. And then it said, After that, no one dared ask any more questions. This is all ESV. They were all just stunned. Like I said, he came to Jesus with an honest question. Jesus gave him an honest answer and told him he's near. He's getting there. He is starting to understand what's happening. And I think that is just really cool because, again, this isn't some blanket statement. All the Pharisees and all the Sadducees and all the scribes are all X, Y, and Z and blah, blah, blah. He treats everyone as individuals because he knows what's in people's hearts. He talks to Peter in one way. He talks to the rich man who came to him in another way. We understand God understands us better than we understand ourselves. That is such a cool place in the scriptures. And it doesn't say afterward what happens next. Aren't you kind of interested? I mean, I'm kind of interested. Did this guy like drop everything and start following Jesus? Did he go back to the Sanhedrin and get chastised for basically saying nice things about Jesus and what Jesus just said. It's kind of interesting. We never find out. Maybe we'll find out in heaven, but we don't know now. And even the apostles might be a little confused. You're supposed to yell at those guys, not tell them they're right and that they're getting close. So this was probably a puzzle for everybody. Jesus went and taught in the temple. He said, how can the scribes say to you, the Messiah, the Christ, is the son of David, when David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, so this is David saying, The Lord said to my Lord, with capital L's, the Lord, sit at my right hand until I put my enemy at your feet. So David calls him Lord, but how is he also his son? This was described a little bit differently in Matthew, but the idea is that people were wondering, how could Jesus be a descendant of David? And he's saying, you know what? Me and the Father talked to David, and Jesus called us both Lord. How do you think that went? When you're God, you get to do crazy things. And one of the things is, is you can defy time, anything. And so he got to not only be the descendant of David, but also visited David. I think that's such a cool thing. And by bringing this out, the son of David was a messianic term. And then he says, beware of the scribes, (laughs) which is funny because he just told a scribe that he was getting there. And now he's just saying in general, beware of the scribes. They walk around with their fancy robes and they love to be greeted in the marketplace. And so everyone can see them. They have the best seats in the temple and they have the best places of honor in the feast. And yet at the same time, they devour the widow's houses and make it a pretense for long prayer. They will receive greater condemnation. There are going to be places that we're going to see later in the New Testament that talks about that if you're a bad shepherd, 
the condemnation on you is higher than on just a regular person. This is the people who are supposed to lead the people of God in the truth of God. And instead, they're interested in status. They're interested in being the honor. Yet, when it says that he's devouring the widow's houses, essentially what would happen is, is that if a widow couldn't afford her taxes, well, let's see if we can't help you. And essentially helping them in their taxes meant that they were going to take her land. She had no means of being an older woman, of producing money for her land. And so they were going to help her out, you know, just to be kind and take what she owned. They could have been kind because of her poverty. They could have been generous. They were probably wealthy men being on top of the Sanhedrin. But instead, they were full of pride. They were full of riches. And they failed to do what was right by their very people. And in this case, the widows. They didn't protect them like they should protect them. I mean, these widows, they're somebody's mother. They're somebody's wife who died. You would like it if someone took care of your mother or your wife if you passed away. They didn't care about anybody. And they didn't love their neighbor. They didn't help them. And they didn't give them mercy. They cared about themselves. So then we have another widow. Boy, we're getting all the widows, right? And so he sat down near the treasury and he watched people putting their money in the offering boxes. And there were a lot of rich people who put large sums of money in there. And I bet you they made a big deal of it. Look at me putting all my denarius in this box. I'm so wealthy and I'm so donating. And this poor widow comes in and puts in two very small copper coins. Calls to his disciples. Hey, watch this. This poor widow has done more in contributing in the offer box than all these other people because she donated out of her poverty. She has given all she had to live on. And I think in the cases, you know, when we hear about rich people in the scripture, we know of rich people who are believers in Jesus, namely Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. That was part of it. We're going to talk about Zacharias later. There's all sorts of people. But in this case, being rich can be a trap. It can trap you into having pride about how much you give. It can trap you in not giving What matters the most? I notice in my own self, you know, when I was poor, it was easier for me to donate, I think, because I didn't have anything. Now I have stuff to lose, namely this house and my retirement. And so then you start caring more about the money so that you can make out in the end. She gave everything she had. Maybe that was going to be her last meal, the last two pieces of copper that she was going to do, but she had enough trust in God to give it away. I mentioned in Small Steps with God about why you give away what they call the first fruits. Wouldn't it be better if I gave away the last fruits because I'd know how many crops I brought in at the end? You know, the idea is you give away the beginning part that you have faith in God, that he will take care of you. It's about leaning on God and trusting in him. And that's what she's doing. Someone said that this would have been worth one sixty-fourth of a denarius, which means a day's wage. So think about how much money you make in a day. Now, if you slice that up into 64 pieces, that's how much she gave. Because it mattered so much to her, it was how she was going to feed herself. She was relying on God to take care of her. And Jesus looks in her heart and he knows what she was caring about. Her gift was worship and trust in God. And I think that the Romans would have liked this because this was showing that people had so much trust in this God that they would give the last thing they own. All right, so that ends chapter 12. My meditation this week is going to be about that widow and about how she walked in with faith and was able to give, trusting that God has her in mind, that God will take care of her. My prayer this week is that I could have that generosity the widow had. It's hard, I think, when you're looking at bills and looking at these earthly things to have that kind of faith that you're going to be taken care of. That's what I'm going to pray for this week. And what I'm going to share is that we shouldn't go around tricking Jesus. If we have honest questions for him, if we have things we want to ask, things we want answered to, places where we have doubt, that's fine. But we never want to go into that situation where we're trying to trick God or trick other Christians or other believers. 
I do a presentation every year at a conference, and I always talked about when I was an atheist, most atheists have questions that they know will shut up Christians. Mine was, do you think I'm going to hell? And it worked because I'm kind of a nice person, right? You wouldn't think of me as going to hell. I'm not a horrible person. I don't do anything to anyone. I've never murdered anyone. I've never stolen someone's husband away. And yet, you know, you'd think, okay, well, Jill's a pretty good person. She does all right. Do you really think that's true? Or some people would say, well, how did you get all the dinosaurs on the ark? You know, some kind of question that gets, gets you to shut up. It's disingenuous. It's just a way to try to trick someone into that. I want to share that that should never be the case. Always go to God with honest questions. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, a better life in smallsteps.com is the home to everything that I do and my friend M. She is a great writer. I'm the talker. And this together is going to be a place for all our podcasts. And it's a blog. There's a few articles out there now, but it's just about having a happy life and making life better. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. <music>